Hi everybody, my name is Paul and I'm a clinical psychologist based at Dubai Community Health Center. Um, so I specialize in child and adolescent development and mental health. So I work with uh, children really from the ages of three upwards um, with a range of, of developmental difficulties and mental health concerns. So some might come to the clinic for assessment of things like ADHD, autism, uh, developmental difficulties, things like dyslexia. Um, and I also support children, teens and adults as well with mental health difficulties like anxiety, uh, low mood, emotion regulation problems. So it's quite a varied and mixed role, but I think that's, that's the beauty in it. So today I'm going to talk to you about ADHD, um, which is quite a common thing that I would see in my role pretty often in the clinic. Um, so as a center, we have psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, occupational therapists and speech and language therapists. And we will get many referrals for uh, children who are presenting with some difficulties. Um, and usually they would be referred by either parents or schools or other professionals. And quite a number of these do present with ADHD. So hopefully today's session will be helpful for you. Um, and it will help your understanding of ADHD and maybe what some of the signs are. So in this session, I want to talk to you about what ADHD is, you know, what, what it looks like, how it presents typically, but also what it's not, because I think there's a lot of misconceptions about ADHD and even whether it exists or not. I'll obviously cover some of the signs and symptoms that identify whether a child might be presenting with ADHD. And I'll talk to you a bit about like, how we assess and diagnose ADHD using the best practice guidelines, um, how we can support children with a diagnosis of ADHD um, at home or in schools. And I want to talk a bit about the roles of, of teachers in schools and educators as well um, for children with, with disorders like this. In terms of what ADHD is, so ADHD means Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Um, and really what that means is the child presents with difficulties in two main areas. And the first one is inattention. So this is anything related to the child's ability to pay attention when they need to. Um, and the second main symptom is hyperactivity or impulsivity. So hyperactivity is the child who's always on the go, quite active, um, always moving around. And impulsivity refers to the, the inability to control our behavior when we need to. Um, so stopping a behavior at a particular time um, or restricting what we're saying in a certain environment, these are all signs of impulsivity. So I will talk to you a bit more about the, the two main symptoms um, and some examples of that in the next slide. But that's generally what ADHD looks like. And it affects approximately 10 to 11% of children and nearly 5% of adults. So it is quite a common condition and it's very, very common in all of our schools and classrooms. And really ADHD falls under the umbrella of a neurodevelopmental disorder, which means that it's related to the development and growth of the brain or the central nervous system. Um, and often parents I meet will ask me, you know, what has caused this? You know, is this something I did with parenting? Is it something I did with reward or emotions or how I behaved? Um, and generally the answer is no. Um, so this is just to help your understanding of where ADHD comes from. So these are the two main symptoms that I mentioned before in the previous slide. So the child who experiences attention difficulties, they often you know, become distracted or sidetracked easily. And um, they can't stay focused for a long period of time. So their attention might wander very fast or very quickly. And um, they might have problems focusing on one thing. And instead their mind is maybe on five different topics at the same time. They might make careless mistakes or make mistakes often because their attention is not really being sustained in the right way that it needs to be. And um, children with inattention issues also, you know, forget things quite a lot. They might appear forgetful or they might need instructions repeated to them. And usually this is because they're not sustaining their attention appropriately for the tasks. Um, so that means they can often leave tasks or activities unfinished or not completed. 
or they might not get things done in the same amount of time that, that other children can do an activity. Um, so the second thing, or the second main symptom of hyperactivity looks like the child who can't really sit still. You know, they might be out of their seat a lot. They might fidget or move around when they're seated. Um, they might talk excessively or be very talkative even when they're supposed to be quiet. Um, they might have problems playing quietly or play very loudly. Um, you know, they're always moving. It's almost like there's an engine or a motor inside them keeping them moving a lot. Um, they might blurt out answers, so they answer very quickly before they actually think through what they should be saying. Um, and they might have difficulties waiting their turn or difficulties controlling what their behavior should be depending on the environment. Um, so very often these symptoms are very evident in the classroom setting because this is where children really have to control their behavior and show high levels of attention for long periods of time. Um, so usually as part of the process of assessment, we would visit the school um, in order to check what the child is doing and how they're behaving and how they're coping there, um, which I'll come to in a second. Within the like umbrella of ADHD, there are three main types. So many children present with a lot of the attention difficulties, but they may not present as overactive. And then there's a second category that can be very overactive and impulsive, but generally their attention is okay. And then there's a third type within the ADHD umbrella that has a mixture of all of the symptoms. So they, they do have attention problems and they appear overactive. So this is just to show you that the combined type is actually the, the one that's most prevalent, um, followed by inattentive only and hyperactive impulsive only. Um, so you might know a child, for example, that really struggles with their attention, but they're not very active or overactive and maybe they could still you know, have a diagnosis of ADHD. So you don't need to have all the symptoms to get a diagnosis. Um, and many children with ADHD have different symptoms than others. Um, but this is just so we can see that there are different types within an ADHD diagnosis. So many parents and adults that I would see have a lot of ideas of what ADHD is or how it's caused or what that means. And generally it's not because of defiance or oppositional behavior. So that means it's not because the child doesn't want to behave or doesn't want to do what they're asked. It's not related to poor understanding or laziness. It's definitely not about bad behavior or just behaving in a way to, to upset people deliberately. Um, and of course, it's not a mental illness or a specific learning disability. So symptoms vary across individuals and contexts, meaning that, you know, Many children with ADHD have different symptoms than others, but also that symptoms can be worse or better or more evident in different settings. So you might notice the symptoms a lot in school and maybe to a smaller degree at home. Um, and some children come to the clinic for assessment and they can, they can behave quite well or quite easily um, in terms of regulating their behaviors, but they might also um, show better levels of attention than is seen at school. Um, and that's why it's so important for us to, to conduct quite a thorough assessment of their functioning so that we're not just basing the information on what we see in the clinic. So I'll talk to you a bit about that as well um, in relation to diagnosis and assessment. So Attitude um, website, and I'll share that link with you at the end of, of this session. Um, they, they have loads of great resources. And from their perspective, they say that ADHD can be diagnosed by a psychiatrist, psychologist, which is me, a pediatrician, um, a nurse or neurologist, a counselor at master's level, or a social worker. Um, but generally speaking, there is no one single test that will diagnose ADHD. So there's no blood test, there's no questionnaire that we can give to parents or teachers, there's no brain scan alone that will determine ADHD. And instead, an assessment process should be multidisciplinary meaning that there should be more than one professional involved. So as a psychologist in Dubai, it's my role if I see a child who, who is presenting with symptoms of ADHD that, you know, I should be including the perspective of parents. I should be talking to teachers. If needed, there can be, you know, other health professionals involved in, in the diagnosis as well. And multi-setting means I can't just use the information that I gather in the clinic. So I really should be liaising with teachers and educators in schools about the child. I should be going to see the child in school 
and observe their behavior. Um, and I should be including the parents in their perspective from the home environment too, so that I'm getting as much information as possible about the child in order to inform my opinion. So one of the most common ways to, to carry out this diagnosis and assessment is via a psychoeducational assessment. So it's quite a lengthy word, but basically this is just an assessment of a child's functioning in various areas. So it will always look at their IQ and intelligence and their academic skills. So how does their reading, writing, mathematics and talking and listening? And how do, they, how do those skills compare to their age group? Also, what is their emotional and behavioral functioning? So are there any emotional difficulties? Are there any behavioral concerns? And the psychoeducational assessment will look at all of these areas and throughout the process of the, of the evaluation of the assessment. So usually these are conducted um, in the clinic by me and other professionals in, 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 in different clinics. Um, in order to identify like a child's profile of, of their strengths and difficulties. So what are their symptoms? Um, you know, do they need a diagnosis or should we rule out a diagnosis as well? Um, and it gives a lot of detail about the child's functioning in, in these different areas compared to their peers. And it also provides lots of guidance and recommendations um, to support the child, both inside and outside of school. So this is really what um, an assessment of ADHD should look like. And it's very similar for conditions like autism um, or if there's concerns about you know, specific academic skills as well. These, this is what psychoeducational assessments involve. So we would always start with an interview with parents to determine you know, their concerns about the child, what's the child's history or development in the past, like when did they start to talk and walk, and um, when did they start nursery or school, how was their behavior then. And then that's followed by individual testing with the child. So this is a process that can take anything between four and six hours. Um, and in, in this time frame, we would be looking at those various areas. So what's the child's IQ and intelligence? How are their academics? How is their emotional and behavioral functioning? But also are there concerns about their memory or their attention? Um, and these are like gold standard tests. So these are the tests that are used internationally by healthcare professionals to assess the child's functioning. And with ADHD and things like autism, we would always have liaison with the school. Um, so this can include like an observation of the child in the classroom. So just last week I went to, to a school to observe a child where there were concerns about ADHD. And it was great because it gave me a lot of insight into the child's behavior in class. Um, and it's a good thing to do at the very beginning of the assessment before the child's familiar with you. Because you can just go in like a, a stranger then. And the child usually behaves normally and that's where you can really see some of the behaviors. Um, and also you can see what the concerns are in school. And then there will always be reports um, from the teachers, like the class teacher or the head of inclusion. And we would share questionnaires with the teachers and with the parents as part of this process. So once all that information is gathered, we would obviously um, interpret all the scores and compare it to the child's age group. Um, and then we write a report about the child's functioning. So the reports are generally quite a lengthy and, and document and they include all of the scores, all of the background information, the child's performance and strengths and difficulties, but also how can they be helped in the next steps or, or what, what is needed moving forward. And then we would feed back to parents and consult with, with teachers and school staff as well. So that's generally what diagnosis looks like um, for ADHD. Um, and really there would be quite careful analysis of you know, the medical guidelines in terms of what an assessment should involve, how it should be carried out, but also what is the criteria for diagnosis and when do you know that a diagnosis is appropriate, but also when is it not appropriate or when, when should you be ruling things out um, so that you're, you're making the best decision and the most informed decision as much as possible. So, of course, we try to support um, adults uh, to help children with ADHD. So you'll see just at the top right of this slide, this is where there's an example of some of the symptoms that the parents might talk about. So just things like easily distracted, uh, can't stop talking, always on the go. And these are classic signs of ADHD. 
So from a psychologist's perspective, I would always try to help parents to reduce the distractibility in the children. And this just means how can we make sure that they're less distracted by, by what's going on um, around them. So in this case, we would always remove or suggest removing non-essential items from a child's working area. And this works quite well in the classroom. And that means that their desk in front of them should just be completely blank, blank. So they don't need any pencils, stationery, paper, post-it notes in front of them because they're very likely to be distracted by those. And then in the environment at home or school, we would suggest to teachers and parents, just be mindful of what's around the child. You know, think about, are they sitting by the window? Is there a busy display board in front of them? Um, are they right by the AC unit, which comes off and on and beeps? Um, or are they sitting at a table with other children who talk quite a lot? Just so they're aware of these factors. Because um, from a psychologist's point of view, we would try to adapt the environment, adapt the child's skills as much as possible, um, as opposed to going down a medication route, which is quite common for children with ADHD. So from my perspective, I would always promote and encourage um, how can we build the child's, child's skills, but also how can we adapt the environment slightly before I would then consider like a, a medication um, option for the child. And then there's simple things like how you even address children and talk to them can, can help a lot. So, for example, if the, the instructions are more specific, they're much more likely to follow instructions. So something like get ready, please, is quite ambiguous and can mean anything to a child, really. But for example, if you give very direct four part instructions like this, you know, sit in your chair, your feet on the floor, and your book and pencil on the desk, please, is a much more directive, specific way to give instructions, which works really well with most kids and especially those with, with an ADHD diagnosis. Children, you know, with ADHD really love to move and they love to be active and they love to, to get moving as much as they can. So children are much more likely to be focused if they can participate uh, and are, are actively participate. So this is the child in the class who will benefit from the teacher saying, oh, you know, can you hand out those sheets for me? Or can you collect those materials? Or can you rub that item off the board? Or can you write your answer up here? So they're much more likely to be engaged if they're moving around. Um, and of course, children with ADHD need lots of movement breaks um, and distraction breaks. So this can even be like a two minute walk outside the classroom or a five minute, you know, relaxation uh, exercise. And these work really well with children who struggle to sustain their attention throughout the day. Of course, teaching children, especially older children with ADHD about attention and what it looks like is a great way to, to improve their skills. And um, so this is something we would encourage after the assessment process. So it includes things like helping a child to know like what's their attention strengths and difficulties. And that's something we can tell from the assessment. So we could say, for example, that a child's verbal attention, so how they hear information, is much better or weaker than their visual attention that they can see visually, like images and pictures. So in the assessment, we can say to parents, actually their visual attention, for example, was quite weak. So they're much better if you say and verbally state instructions and information rather than looking at the board or observing pictures or images. Um, and helping them to know their strengths and difficulties is quite useful. And also like what's most likely to distract them. Obviously breaking big activities and tasks into manageable steps is quite useful for children with ADHD. Um, so instead of reading a whole book, can we read a chapter? Can we read three pages? And that's much more likely to lead to better engagement. Another website I've recommended in the past is called Fast Forward. Um, and this really is a program to try to develop children's attention skills. So this is for children who really struggle to sustain their attention. And what they say is, like what I would say as well, is that environment is, is very, very important and it's key for helping children with, with attention problems. Mm -hmm. So they make recommendations about the workspace, using post-it notes and reminders making sure the child get lots of outdoor time and breaks and being aware of snacks and drinks and food and, and how that affects children's activity levels as well. 
obviously for children who are overactive, we need to like try to, to encourage them to remain calm as much as possible. Um, and I always tell parents, you know, try to remain as calm as possible whenever children are, are presenting as overactive because this shows them appropriate behavior, but it also encourages them to calm down and it keeps the whole scenario and setting quite calm as well. It's easier said than done, but it's something that does work quite well if you try it. Fidget alternatives are something that a lot of children that I see use. So some of them might just have a little piece of string. Um, or if I'm sure many parents remember the fidget spinners as well. Um, or the little one on, on the slide is one that I have in my office. Because some children just like to fiddle with things while they talk. Um, so this can be great for improving focus in, in lessons or at homework time. And again, you know, be careful how you discuss and talk about a child's behavior. So if you're likely to, you know, criticize or make comments about children, it's, it's fine to do that to some degree, but you have to make your comments about um, the action or the behavior of the child rather than the child themselves. So you can say things like, you know, your talkativeness is a bit disruptive or you know, you, you, your chattiness is, is distracting people rather than you are holding people back or you are being disruptive. Um, and it's quite a small difference, but it can have a big impact on children's self-esteem. So this is something that I often suggest to, to teachers and to parents just to be aware of when they're addressing children with some of these symptoms. Another thing that works really well for the chatty child is story boxes. So this just means that the child who always wants to tell you something or to talk about something or to share a story or to share an experience is just encouraged as much as possible to quickly write down the topic and put it into a story box. And instead of them getting into lots of stories, they just put the, they physically put the story title into a box. And this just means that once a period of time has passed or the activity or the homework task is finished, then they can choose one story from the story box to tell you. And this works really well if you physically have a box and make the child write down the topic, especially with younger children. And then with older children, they can mentally think, okay, is that something I'll say now or something I'll just put in the story box for later? So with older children, they don't necessarily need a physical box, but they can, they can get the message in the same manner. Of course, be aware of diet and and drinks in relation to activity levels for children who are overactive. And, um, you know, I've met parents before who, whose children, you know, eat very sugary breakfasts or very, you know, high carb breakfasts. And, you know, they immediately wonder why their child is so active or can't sit still in class. And, you know, it's something that I suppose not everybody's aware of, but it's something that's so important, especially if a child is a very, sugary or sweet or refined or sorry the the simple carbohydrate lunch before they have to sit and you know focus at a desk in class um, as opposed to like refined carbs or low sugar snacks or healthy healthy options um, and i think that's key in the classroom as well so these are just some examples of the ways that a, ch a child's environment can be adapted when they have an adhd diagnosis um, so these are some examples of alternative seating. So you'll see the one on the left. Um, make sure that there's nothing on the, the top of the desk except the child's book and pencil. Items are close by but out of reach. Um, close by but out of sight, sorry. So they can actually reach them, but they're not in their line of sight. So they're less likely to be distractible. And likewise here. And then here you have a little foot swing for the child so that they can use their energy resources and demonstrate a little bit of overactivity in a healthy, non-disruptive way. So this is also the case here for the little rope where the child can rest their feet and swing around if they want to. Some children work really well with, with stand-up desks um, and that means they can just get up and kind of move a little bit if they need to do that. Um, and this is an example of like a wobble cushion or like a, a different cushion for a child to sit on on top of the regular chair. So this just means they can kind of move around and use a bit of energy while they're seated without actually disrupting the class too much. So just before we finish, I wanted to talk about the role of schools and educators with, with children with ADHD, because of course they need very specific um, accommodations within the academic setting. 
and that's key really. So a lot of schools will be aware of this and they know how to manage some of these symptoms um, and some of these, you know, the children who present with these diagnoses. But it's multifaceted really and it can be very simple practical things like how the room is set up or how worksheets and tests are presented to children who are distractible. Um, Because what we would say is a child with ADHD is much more likely to focus and engage with a worksheet that has less distractions, and less visuals and less patterns and borders. Um, Because they're less likely to be distracted by all those those parts of of worksheets that aren't necessary, um, but are just there to add detail. And it can also include supporting their social skills and how lessons are presented to sustain their attention um, and how to help organize students. So what we would suggest for any teachers and educators is to know the signs of ADHD, you know, confidently identify children if you think they might be presenting with some of these difficulties and encourage parents to seek diagnosis and further assessment if that's necessary. And of course, use our psychoeducational assessment reports. So whenever we finish the assessment process, we share the report with families and they often give them to school teachers. And that's how the school devises a plan to support the child. Um, And generally, my experience is that schools in Dubai use them very well um, and they're quite welcoming of these and and they're they're usually very happy to to receive these um, because it gives them a full picture of the child's functioning, but also how they can be supported. And of course, a lot of schools will use something called an individualized education plan or an IEP. So if some of the mums aren't familiar with this, this just means that The child has been identified as needing additional supports or accommodations within school beyond what the mainstream is. So many, many children have IEPs in schools and it can be for something like ADHD or low attention or things like dyslexia or autism or reading problems or social difficulties. So in any classroom, somebody is very likely to have an IEP. and they're likely to be supported by this. So it means that the child will have individual goals for them within school, um, and these will be updated regularly, and these will be targeted with very specific intervention from school staff. So you can see that the schools have a big part to play as well, so don't be afraid if you think that there are symptoms in your child or a child that you know. Don't be afraid to share this with school because they're usually very very cooperative and very open to, to the idea of supporting children like this. And I just wanted to play you a little video to show you what some of the symptoms of ADHD look like and how that's experienced by somebody with ADHD. So it's not very long and I hope it plays, but it's just to show you what it looks like um, day to day. What's it like to have ADHD? So what's it like to have ADHD? Some people daydream or find it difficult to concentrate. Others feel angry. Sometimes you feel like lashing, lashing out in the middle. Your heart starts, your know, body starts like really rough and like hot and all that. It's like, feel like it's all like really aggressive. So he feels aggressive, like a human volcano. Exactly. But doesn't that mean he might be in trouble a lot or might feel bad about himself? Yes, but some people with ADHD don't feel like that at all. Some daydream. So do you feel like you can't pay attention very well? Only when I'm taking the tests. Mm. I get distracted. I'm like, mm. Then I'm off in my own little world. <laughs> What's yeah. it like in that world? Fun. I get to draw, paint, do whatever I want. Ah. Um, and, I, and I also get to buy my own dog. It sounds like a lovely world. Why, why do you think it's a problem? Because I don't get my work done. So she was daydreaming, which sounds fun, but means she's not concentrating on her schoolwork. Right, and focusing is a problem for some people, whether they daydream or not. The worst problems I really have involves like schoolwork and like not being able to finish classwork before the other students. What they do in my math class is when we're done with a test, our teacher will ask us and. She'll tell us to raise our hands if we're not finished, and sometimes I'll end up being the only one in the classroom, and everyone will kind of stare at So he struggles to concentrate. Whoa! That 
That's right. And some people feel like they're on the outside, that things are out of their control. Like, I say stuff that I don't even, like, know why I said that. And then a couple minutes, like, wow, did I just really do that? I can't believe I did that. So ADHD can feel different to different people. Yes. And that's why it's difficult to tell who has it. So that was just to show you what some of the symptoms of ADHD looks like and to remind you that although there are common symptoms in children, they do vary from person to person and, and not really, not any two children have the same symptoms. And that's why I spoke to that so key. So these are the resources that are great for families of, of children who might have an ADHD diagnosis. So attitudemag.org is one of the ones I always recommend to parents. Chad and Healthline are other ones that have lots of useful resources and information about ADHD. And if parents like our mums are concerned about a child's presentation or they might think that they know somebody who has ADHD, of course, ask for help and take the next steps. You know, come and see one of us at, at the Bike Community Health Centre. And, you know, we can take it from there and take the next steps. Or even if you just want more information, you know, about, you know, the services in your area or more information about ADHD, just get in touch. I'm happy to be contacted, really. Um, and these are my details. Check out my Instagram. Give me a follow. And you can email me directly if you've got questions or concerns. Um, or you can check out our website, which is below as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Paul. Welcome. Your talk was very helpful and it cleared things for us. <laughs> um, so if anyone has any questions or, or would like to make any comments, they're welcome to do that in the chat or they can turn on their mic, I think. Um, but of yes. course, some mums prefer just to contact me directly afterwards and that's fine as well. Yeah. And if they, they can raise their hands too and I can unmute them or they can write down in the box, in the chat box. So until they do that, should I ask my question? <laughs> of course, yeah, no worries. And so, um, so how about a child that was very doing very good in school and, and is getting high marks, but at the same time he was diagnosed with the ADHD? Will he need medication or, or no? Well, really it depends on like the impact of, of his symptoms. You know, a lot of children with ADHD don't take medication and that's perfectly fine. And it really just depends like if the environmental accommodations and the strategies used within his environments are helpful. So, you know, is he using specific apps or, you know, different techniques to improve his attention? Does he have specific accommodations to reduce his overactivity? And if those things are all working and there's not really a huge impact, you know, on his academics, then I would say he probably doesn't need medication. Um, but of course, I'm basing that on quite limited information. But I think that if things are going okay, then likely the answer is no. But he won't be struggling or it's only for schoolwork, the medication? Well, it really depends if, if he is struggling or not. If he's, if he's performing okay and he's doing quite well and he thinks that he's, that he's doing okay, then there's probably no need for medication. But if there is a huge impact um, and the environmental accommodations and strategies aren't working, so like some of the things I said, um, yeah. so if they aren't working, then, then parents can consider medication as an option. So they would just need to see a psychiatrist to do that. And yeah. We have them at the Bike Community Health Centre if people want, want to even ask questions with them. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Um, there's Jude. Jude is asking, I would like to know what is the solution to control ADHD child at school? Is it to have a shadow teacher or a proper plan to be in place? Mm. Thanks for the question. And it's a great question that many parents have. And, and I suppose the question really differs depending on the individual child. You know, some children will need very specific supports in certain areas that others might not need. And I think really the best thing to do with a child, you know, who has symptoms of ADHD is to, um, to conduct an assessment to check what exactly is their functioning, what is their strengths and difficulties, where exactly do they need the support or what is the biggest impact. 
and what's the view of school? Because some children with ADHD will need a shadow teacher. Um, some won't, some might need it for a while, but then it can be removed. Um, or some might just need like specific interventions within the classroom or within the school setting um, without actually a shadow teacher. So the answer varies depending on the child. Um, and so an assessment is a good place to start that. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Natasha has a question. Uh, so she's asking if uh, ADHD is for life. So both of her brothers were diagnosed with, uh, with it in childhood. Yeah, generally speaking, ADHD is a diagnosis that, that stays for life, but the symptoms can vary across the lifetime and they can have a, you know, a, a different impact across different stages of life. So, for example, we know in like the diagnostic criteria that children are much more likely to report feeling overactive and they, they'll run around and they, they, they can't sit still and they can't you know, stay focused. Whereas this presents in teenagers and adults as like a restlessness and they just feel like they can't really get settled or feel like they're resting at any time, um, as opposed to, to feeling overactive. So the symptoms do change um, across the lifespan and also they change depending on what, our, what, our, what the demands are on us. You know, for a child who's in year six or grade five, um, there's very different demands on them to stay focused and to, to not be overactive compared to, you know, a 19 year old who plays lots of sports and who's maybe in college a few days a week. Um, and that's how the symptoms can vary, um, both in what comes from the inside of the person, but also by what's around them and what the demands are placed in them. But generally speaking, it is something that's around for, for life. Yeah. So adults, uh, it can be diagnosed with the ADHD or yeah, yeah. yeah so some children receive some some people receive a diagnosis very late in life and um, you know well into adulthood but it, it, it does happen yeah the thing is for for a diagnosis of adhd we have to be certain as medical professionals that the symptoms were there throughout their lives and they were present in their childhood so this is not something where somebody is very calm and relaxed and has great attention throughout their years and then suddenly when they're 15 they've you know really poor attention and poor focus and that would not generally meet criteria for a diagnosis so there has to be evidence throughout the the person's lifetime like schooling and earlier education that these difficulties were there to meet the diagnostic criteria which is why it's seen as a lifelong thing and um, so that's the, you know, the key issue, you know, in, in adult diagnosis is the evidence that the symptoms were always there. Thank you so much, Dr. Paul. No worries. Uh, anybody have any other questions? Uh, uh, yeah, Natasha's asking, um, is Ritalin still prescribed? I don't know if I pronounce it right. I'm not entirely sure of the answer to that because the psychiatrist will know medication better than me, but it really depends on the country that, that Natasha is in or what the guidelines are there. Um, but there are different medications with different you know, pros and cons to them. Um, I know Concerta, for example, is a very common one for ADHD. Um, but they could check with the psychiatrist that they really specifically want information about Ritalin because I'm not sure if it's here in the UAE. So it's like uh, the, the medication is like, like continuous? It's not like for a certain time you stop? Well, some children will take a medication for a specific duration, but some might just find that it's quite useful and they'll take it for a longer time. Mm -hmm. uh, some parents will say that you know, they didn't like some of the, the effects that it had, or some parents just don't want their children taking medication at all. Um, so it really varies on how long a child will take the medication, depending on how it helps or you know, whether there's any additional side effects. Um, but some people do take them for, for a long time and some of the people I'm working with have, have taken it, you know, for years. Thank you so much. Uh, there's another question. Um, so how about supplement stock? Yeah, I mean, I suppose you would have to just check what are the supplements claiming to do and what impact do they have? And, you know, as long as they're certified, you know, by, you know, like the health authority of the country that, that Maryam is in, then, you know, I'm sure it's worth a try, you know, if, you know, I would always recommend as many, you know, different strategies as possible. And, 
just to consider the options and how that helps. You know, some parents will say to me that specific diets work really well and, or, you know, the removal of a certain food from a diet really helps. And that can be the case, especially with sugar. Um, but the thing is, there's no specific uh, medical evidence that will point you in one direction of a diet or a supplement. Um, so we know that a lot of the, the environmental accommodations work quite well, but also teaching the child as an individual, like how they can you know, manage and regulate their emotions and behaviors works quite well. So that's usually through psychological therapy. And then of course, there's an option for medication too. So how about, is it genetic? Is ADHD genetic? Like if one child has it, uh, the, the second child might have it too, or it's not, it only runs in families. There is some evidence to suggest that there are higher rates of ADHD in certain families, and we would always check that, you know, with with parents if, if there are concerns. But that would relate to anything really, and it, it applies to like mental health conditions like depression or anxiety, but also things like autism and ADHD. Um, so it's not the only factor, and there's no single gene that's been identified. Um, but it is something just to keep in mind, you know, if, if we're conducting an assessment and diagnosis. Yeah. Um, there's no clear answer just yet. Thank you so much. No problem. You're welcome. And again, if anybody wants to contact me afterwards for information or resources or if they have a question, you know, feel free to do that.